All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jorgen Rose of Practical Farmers of Iowa. Joining me behind the scenes is Hannah Grosspeach, so you might hear her voice at some point. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this virtual field day. What did the river say when it saw the beaver? I'll be damned. There's a little beaver joke there to get us started. Don't worry, I've already been told that's the last joke I can share this evening. If you're a farmer, landowner, or land manager in the upper Midwest, you're probably wondering, you know, why in the heck are we talking about beavers this afternoon? Uh, what you may not know is that beavers are nature's environmental engineers, providing a host of ecosystem services that can actually improve water quality, water quantity, and of course provide lots of habitat. So we're going to hear a bit today about how bringing beavers back to the landscape, or at least mimicking some of their behaviors, can benefit uh, farmers and landowners. To tell us more, we're once again broadcasting live this afternoon from the Office of Landowners and Farmers, Jeff and Nancy Puddens, and from the Office of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Private Lands Biologi Biologist, Derek Weisenflu. So this virtual field day is the second of a three-part series exploring the work that Jeff, Nancy, and Derek have done on Jeff and Nancy's property to preserve, restore, and enhance rare and declining habitats. So I will paste a link to Jeff's first virtual field day discussing oxbows into the chat here shortly. You can watch the recorded version of that field day if you're interested and you can also join us next week to hear more about long-term habitat management and uh, land protection strategies. So I'm going to let Jeff and Derek take it away here in just a minute but I want to thank them up, up front once again for their willingness to share their time and their experiences and their expertise with us today. But as you probably expect by now, if you've tuned into some of these virtual field days before we get to the good stuff, I do need to do a few acknowledgements and take care of some housekeeping. So first, I want to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, as always, for partnering with us on this field day. We couldn't do this without their expertise. And then I'm going to paste a web link for more information on the Iowa Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. If you're interested in learning more about native habitat, about federal trust resources, uh, if you want to know more about conserving rare and declining species and habitats, I would highly recommend that you check out that website and uh, maybe reach out to a private lands biologist like Derek uh, near you. And I also want to give a shout out today to uh, our field day sponsor, the Iowa Environmental Council, uh, which is sponsoring this event. Since 1995, the Iowa Environmental Council has been the state's largest and most comprehensive environmental coalition. Their nonpartisan alliance of clean water, clean energy, and healthy climate organizations and individuals work together to unify Iowans and, and advocate. You can learn more at iaenvironment.org. I also want to thank all of our field day sponsors. So these are some of our level A field day sponsors without support from sponsors like the environmental, Iowa Environmental Council and all of these A-level sponsors that you see here. But we could not put on over 60 virtual field days and events this summer free of charge. And I also want to give a shout out to all our B-level sponsors. So again, the support of all of our sponsors uh, makes this field day season possible. Just a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. PFI is a farmer member organization, which means that our farmers set our priorities and point us where they want to go. And we achieve our mission of equipping farmers to build resilient farms and communities in many ways, uh, most notably through on-farm research and by empowering farmers and landowners to connect and share knowledge. So virtual field days like this one are just one of the many ways that we work to make connections, share knowledge, and build community. You can learn more about uh, the many other great things that we do, and you can learn more about becoming a PFI member and all the associated benefits on our website, uh, practicalfarmers.org. So just a little bit about uh, today and how today is going to go. Here very shortly, I'm going to turn things over to Jeff and Derek. We'll plan around wrapping up around 5.30, so about half an hour for today's field day. We will take some clarifying questions throughout. Feel free to type those into the Zoom chat and we can relay those to Jeff and Derek so they can answer them. If there are some bigger questions that come up, uh, always feel free to type those into the chat, but we might hold on to them until the end of the field day or until maybe it's more appropriate to answer those. So if you chat a question and we don't get it answered right away, we haven't forgot about you, uh, we will do our very best to make sure that all the questions get answered. And then I also want to mention that upon exiting the Zoom event this evening, you'll be prompted to take a survey. Uh, we really encourage you to take a few minutes and tell us what you thought about this virtual field day. We really value that input. We read every single review of these field days that we get and we use that information to make our events better. So please take a few minutes and complete that evaluation. 
here's just a little image about uh, Zoom. And so, as you can see, you can click the chat box and feel free to uh, type questions into there. We do ask that you make sure this two box here, this little blue box is says to all panelists and attendees, not just to all panelists. We want uh, everybody on the on the webinar today to be able to see the questions that are asked. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jeff and Derek. So we will stop this. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sure can. Are you seeing the presentation all right? Yep. Good deal. Yep. Well, yes, thank you, Jorgen. Um, I'm Derek Weisenflum, a fish and wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. And uh, excited to talk today about kind of an unusual practice, at least here in Iowa, and share a little bit about what Jeff and I have tried and and experimented with and learned, learned from uh, to this point. Jeff, do you wanna give a quick introduction on yourself? Oop, hold on, Jeff, you're muted. I see you. you yes, I, I am Jeff Pudens and my wife, Nancy, we purchased this ground some years ago and uh, we see it as a diamond in a rough, but there's a lot of things that we need to improve on it or try to control. And one of the things was the great amount of the water, the speed the water came through and the dirt that was in the water. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Derek. We'll head on. Fantastic. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges Jeff faces on his property. Um, we'll start off with a quick overview of his location and, and habitats on the property uh, and talk a little bit about what brought us together. Um, to work on this particular project, which is Beaver Dam Analogs, um, and talk hopefully a little bit more in detail and have time to really dive in a little bit about what we've, what our objective, objectives were, um, kind of how we designed them, uh, and then get into a little bit more of the costs and time and maintenance that we put into them so far, just to give people an idea of how this practice might compare to some other practices. Uh, and then try to kind of wrap up by sharing some useful resources for folks and some closing points. Uh, from Jeff and I, and then of course leave it open to questions uh, and promote our, our next uh, virtual field day next week. So with that, I'll just give a quick overview uh, and then we're going to kind of show a video here to keep things fresh. Uh, Jeff, your property is located in Green County, Jeff and Nancy's property uh, in the North Raccoon River watershed. Uh, they have, uh, as you can see, I'm going to pull up the cursor here. Um, the property here in the watershed, this would be uh, a tributary to Cedar Creek, which then falls into the North Raccoon River here. And on the right hand side, you'll see a map of their actual property. Uh, and I've kind of denoted some of the property features, but it is a rather unique property for its size. It's got uh, everything from uh, oak savanna uh, and fen and oxbow habitats that we talked about last week. To, uh, to oak woodland and this intermittent stream that we're gonna focus on today. And so with that, I will try to get to the next slide. We're gonna do a little overview here, drone footage of the property uh, of where we've been working on these beaver dam, uh, this beaver dam system. And uh, I will uh, switch to that video. And Jeff and I will share a little bit about this system and you guys can get a little feel for what it actually looks like on the landscape. Are you seeing it, Jorgen? Yep, looks good. All right, now I just got to get this bar out of the way to push play. All right, so we're, we're actually working our way downstream here. This is uh, the creek right behind Jeff's house. And uh, Jeff, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you've seen go on in this, this system since you bought the property uh, and kind of what your initial concerns were. Well, this little creek here has about 1,600 to 1,800 acres of ground dumped into it. Uh, generally, like you say, it's a nice little meandering creek with low volume of water. 
but you get an inch or two of rain and it will go up four to six foot. And if you get sometimes that lovely four inches of rain, you get 12 foot where that creek is completely out of its banks. Uh, when that happens, that creek turns to chocolate and we see a lot of sediment. Derek and I have come together and, and trying to solve this problem uh, come up brainstorming with a bunch of ideas and he says well let's try beaver dams and I am a farmer and beaver dams aren't exactly something that we just always try to uh, associate with but this is all woodland so they're not destroying any crops and I also thought that if we could encourage the beavers to eat the woods or the, this part of the area we wouldn't have any trouble with them because uh, they're not eating planted crops. Uh, quite an, a learning experience. We've done a lot and learned a lot how to design these dams. And now we are in a drought. This creek is what I'd say completely dry. And we have seven dams there. Six are very viable. And of them six dams, we've held at least two foot of dirt back. And that's two foot deep and up to 50 foot back. So we are doing the job. We just have to get some beavers in there. Yeah, and you know, I guess I just paused the video here so you guys know, um, that just to kind of show how this creek flows into the bigger tributary here, which is Cedar Creek. Uh, and the last talk we talked about was at Oxbows, and you can see that on the right-hand side of the screen, um, which is actually the old bend of this uh, creek we're actually talking about today. So you can see it's a relatively small, narrow stream. It's extremely flat, flashy. Um, and then it, it you know, dumps into Cedar Creek here, which then flows to the North Raccoon River. Uh, and just to kind of, I'll let it play out here for a few more seconds, show what, how the landscape looks around the area. You know, it's, Jeff, you can describe the area, but this is your alfalfa field we're seeing here. Um, and then as we pan, we'll see this is a mix of crop and riparian areas, essentially crop in the higher, flatter ground typically, and then um, and then, uh, you know, more of the riparian zones as we get the river areas and these tributaries. From, so the just, go yeah. ahead, Jeff. From the beginning of my property to where it runs in the Cedar Creek, there's 32 foot drop. On the sides, uh, we have a lot, a lot of difficult land. That's, wh that's why it is all farm ground is, or that's why it is all wood. It, it's just not farmable. Uh, it's pretty steep and I think that is probably one of our problems. Uh, it is so steep that the water just comes shooting down there until it gets to the end of my property. So, our, so is, oh, is, our goal is to, to decrease the sediment coming down and slow that water down. Yep, and you can see the map's not real big here, but we've got Jeff mentioned seven beaver dam analogs. They start up here towards the upper end of his property and there are, are space at different intervals uh, based on kind of the stream meanders and what we're trying to achieve um, as far as that velocity change and this diversity of habitat that we're, we're gonna dive into. So we're gonna run stream through this really quick. Jeff mentioned the sediment concerns he has, which is kind of the diagram on the left. The photo on the right is actually of an, a beaver dam that existed right after I met Jeff, which is actually on Cedar Creek, just upstream of where we just showed you in that drone video. Um, and this is a, a very small beaver dam, and you can kind of see it's in a low, low flow time. Uh, I believe this dam was ripped out about two months or so later by either the county or, or someone. Um, and I'm not, not real sure why, as you see, it doesn't really cause any damage, um, but I see this as I guess I'll say one, a, a, a work of art, uh, especially after having built what we're gonna show you as our, our beaver dam analogs. Uh, but beavers are the original engineers on the landscape and they were building these um, you know, for their purposes, of course, and th those things are not always where we want them, um, but they have a very positive impact for us from a recreational standpoint, from a habitat diversity standpoint, and from some of the other standpoints that we'll talk about in terms of really diversifying the habitat on the landscape. And so my point here in showing this picture is simply to show you that beavers were in the area, which obviously did feed into Jeff and Nancy's interest in getting them on their property. 
uh, at least in that having a place where they could go to be maybe safe uh, uh, from, from, you know, dams being removed and so forth. So I guess I kind of touched on, you know, those key important issues, but I mean, beavers really are the key to keystone species and original wetland engineer uh, without them. Um, we can obviously engineer things, but it is far easier and simpler to work with beaver than against them wherever we can. Uh, for Jeff and Nancy and I, the reason we started working together, like Jeff alluded to, was you know Jeff had this interest and concern for the resource. Um, originally, Jeff, and we talked about this in last presentation, you would pursue potentially building a larger dam um, to really hold back a significant amount of sediment and create a wetland, um, an earthen dam. Uh, correct, Jeff? Yes. Yep. Yes, we, we talked about that, but we're, we're going to explore all possibilities first. I, 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 on this beaver dam deal, I think we're really in the right direction. We are accomplishing it. We are slowing the water down. We are getting rid of the sediment. Uh, I think we would have the beavers in there now, except for one thing I realized. They prefer corn over tree roots. <laughs> and, it, and whenever they have corn available, that's what they're going to use. And that's why this is a unique situation in that, um, you know, one of the reasons I was okay and comfortable trying this and experimenting with this with Jeff is this is not an area that is right adjacent to crops like Jeff said. And so, you know, that was part of the consideration if beavers were to colonize here is having this, you know, not where it's going to cause uh, problems right away. But, you know, for Jeff and I initially as we talked through things and what he was trying to achieve, you know, we, we Fish and Wildlife Service don't usually build large dams uh, and especially my program, um, we were looking for, you know, more natural op options to achieve the same goals. And so, you know, this was just an experimental idea that I threw out at Jeff based on my, my uh, knowledge of it out west and something that I had always wanted to try and Jeff and Nancy were kind enough to say, well, you know, it's not quite what we we're looking for, but then again, let's try it and see what happens. And so for that, I give them kudos and let me experiment and, and play around and, and their, their help on this. And again, there's so many benefits from beavers and beaver dams. Uh, Jeff's system here is quite uh, incised, at least in, in areas. Um, and we're, we're holding back a lot of sediment, we're trying to rebuild what's been um, become incised, uh, which is only gonna help groundwater recharge in the area. Uh, and maybe one of the best things about this is these are extremely cheap, uh, and very low tech, and we're going to show you what that looks like for us here in a second. So, Jeff, I'll just say, and you can chime in at any point. Um, this is the headwaters of this intermittent stream. It was an intermittent stream historically. It's nearly perennial now, but like Jeff said, it's actually dry this year, uh, given the drought conditions in the area. Um, but it's fed by almost 2,000 acres of watershed, drained tile watershed. Um, and on the right, you can see he's got some bank erosion. Um, and the bottom photo there is what happens during those one, two inch rains Jeff talked about where it just blows out of the banks because it is a very confined floodplain. Uh, it just blows out of the banks and, uh, you know, is, is going at an accelerated rate towards Cedar Creek there, um, towards the bottom of the system, uh, which is why it blew out that old stream channel that is now an oxbow. Uh, so, yeah. The, Go ahead, Jeff. The, increased, the increased volume of water has changed changed it a lot. Where it used to meander, now it, it comes down a lot faster. And that's and when water gets speed, it gets power. And that's that's why it's cutting into these banks more and why we're trying to devise a way to stop that. We want we need to slow that water down so that it has time to clean up. Yeah, and that's exactly right. We want to, you know, that's a lot of the erosion we're seeing in the sediment that Jeff has mentioned that we're, we're trying to capture is from those banks. Um, for Fish and Wildlife Service and, and Jeff and Nancy have been straight on board. We're trying to, we're trying to really, you know, increase the habitat diversity and complexity and allow the system to function more naturally, meaning, um, like Jeff said, you know, essentially slow down that water um, and allow these natural processes to function which have also water quality benefits and the other benefits that we've talked about. And so this is one of the beaver dam analogs. The photo on the left is looking downstream and you can see the bank just downstream that takes a sharp corner to the left there. And then a photo on the right, uh, which shows it looking upstream. And so it's a so kind of a semi straight stretch that's heading really sharp into a curve. Um, and this is one of the wider sections that we've uh, built these beaver dam analogs across. 
and so initially we started with these posts driven um, or driven posts, these natural posts that are driven into the stream bank and then weaving willows because we wanted to use, you know, willows, which are one of the beaver's favorite food and actually established some willows next to these beaver dam analogs. Um, and willow is really easy to work with. And I actually had an excess of it to contribute to the project since we were often trying to get rid of willow elsewhere. Um, but Jeff came up with the idea, why not use our our uh, cedar boughs, our cedar tree limbs, uh, which turned out to be quite a bit better, wouldn't you say, Jeff? I think they've they've actually functioned a lot better. They they were easier for us to put in, and and yeah, they ha they uh, held a lot more water. For some reason, they worked better. Yep, and so this is just showing kind of this is early on the project. These were installed in 2018 October of 2018 is when we first got at least this particular one in, I believe. Um, and try to get to the next one here. Sorry. Technical difficulty on and slides. we drove them all in. We left them about four to six foot tall. And, and we have learned now that we need to leave an area for it, it to escape to. So in the middle there, you'll see they're only two foot tall. And uh, that channels that water to the center there. So, so that our initial... Yeah, get great learning experience, Jeff. Our initial thought was, you know, we want to hold back as much as we can from the get-go, and that's a, a very major mistake with these, uh, is over-engineering them and trying to do too much at one time. And so, like Jeff said, you see in the middle there of these photos where we've actually kind of cut down those middle uh, post-driven stakes, which during the biggest flows allows that water to still escape essentially without tearing out our posts. But we've actually lost very few posts they have rearranged a little bit or pushed to different angles for sure, but you can actually see how they're catching debris. And even in the winter time, um, we're not we're not losing these. The last last two years, uh, we've not lost really any through winter, which is somewhat surprising given what we'd expect for ice flows and so forth. Um, one thing I wanted to show, and it's hard to see from these photos. Jeff mentioned the two feet we're holding back. So on the right side photo. Uh, where that ice and river is there is it's about two feet higher than the downstream side and that is now completely filled with sediment and this is the current year photo from just literally this weekend Jeff sent me of that same beaver dam analog and of course the stream is dry but that is all sediment that is filled in behind that analog structure which you can barely see I'll try to pull up the pointer here right in the middle and so at this point we've actually held back um, potentially my est best estimate on this one right now is about a thousand cubic yards of material, but it actually is probably more and, and we're basically tapped out for holding back sediment, but you can see the pool of water downstream. This is the habitat complexity side of things. Instead of the, everything being completely dry, there is a small pool of water, which small, it's important, uh, from a habitat standpoint, and it's showing that we're creating this complexity. Uh, in the system, which is my goal in working with Jeff and Nancy, aside from just the sediment, is to also increase the habitat. Jeff, do you have I anything see, else to say on this yeah. one? Somebody asked the question about how deep or how long were the poles. I believe they were all eight foot, and yep. then we cut, we cut the ones in the middle, which we tried to go down two to three foot in the in the ground, and then in the center there, they would be about five foot. They were three foot in the ground and two two foot out. So this eight foot poles and five foot poles. And this is a, just a, this is a different uh, shot of a different beaver dam analog here. Um, it's actually just downstream of the one I just showed you. Uh, and what I really want you to notice is this pool of habitat that we've created, which is exactly what beavers are doing is they're slowing water. So this is what Jeff talked about. This is not a huge flood event, but you can see how the difference in water level here in the center from um, upstream to downstream, uh, which creates that complexity and is allowing that water to cycle more, um, which is better for the nutrient cycling side of things as well. Uh, the photo on the upper right here shows the ice, you know, completely frozen winter. Again, these things are incredibly strong and we did not engineer these to any particular flow event or, um, or withholding, you know, these physical features. But that is the beauty of what beavers are doing is simple structures that are very tough and they do at times blow out, of course, which is also okay from my perspective, um, but 
they, uh, they do hold up really well. And then I'll just say in the bottom left photo, shows it pretty well, um, but maybe hard to see scale wise. This is the exact same one you're seeing in the other photos. And that's completely filled with sediment on the upstream side. And you can see the diversity of vegetation now also coming in as we've built up the sediment behind the beaver dams with a plunge pool on the downstream side. Uh, and again, so we're just trying to balance the, the goals Jeff had with sediment collection and capture with the goals I had, which is the habitat side. And, and this seems to be doing really well. And I, I would say that these are gonna be permanent we won't take them out. Hopefully they'll get buried by the sediment over the years. Uh, we're trying to create a new base. We're trying to raise it up so things aren't going downstream so fast. Yeah, and then, and so what we'll have to do over time to continue building those up and raising, uh, it's called aggradation of the stream bed. So we're trying to re-raise that incision or get rid of that incision and build the stream bed back up is we'll actually install some more wood posts in that existing structure and continue to build it basically one foot, two foot at a time. Now, we'd really like Beaver to be doing that for us and that obviously could still happen, um, but right now they are not in the area and so that is kind of our job uh, to do that. But I, I guess I wanted to jump into a, a quick summary. I know we're down to a few minutes here of installation and costs and stuff to give folks an idea. Jeff, we installed, I wanna say all, well, six or seven in a single day uh, initially, and I think it was about six hours of time, basically with that you and I and Kirk here, who we see with Fish and Wildlife and Nancy as well. But most of it was just us in that one day. Is that is that your memory as well? Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. Yep. And then we had, I think, a couple structures that needed to be, you know, upgraded after one big winter flood event. Um, so we came back and did a half day of maintenance, I think, again on them. So we've had these in for a couple of years and had kind of a once annual kind of, I'd say maintenance on, on average. Um, the cost for these, I'll say the posts were, were $600 for seven BDAs. Uh, and that's the only actual product cost besides, um, you know, our time that we've put into this. Um, Cause we're using the natural cedar boughs. We're using uh, a post pounder that we Fish and Wildlife Service has. And so there's, they're really, this is again, the low tech, very cheap, costly, um, benefit of these structures. Um, and, and I'd say even, oh, go ahead. And, and being a man and a boy, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is a lot of fun. And uh, we've had a great time and it's had, had again, I think it's, it's been impressive, both you and I, Jeff, uh, in terms of what we've accomplished in a relatively short period of time. Uh, I wanna say, I wanna just keep things moving and we can circle back if there's time to questions and show more photos, but there are a lot of resources on this, and I want to say we didn't just throw these in uh, without any planning, any thought whatsoever. In fact, this is a regulated floodplain, and so there are permit requirements that I helped Jeff and Nancy uh, make sure we met. Um, but there are a lot of at, at resources about these uh, online um, from really what I would say are the experts, which this is being done out west, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on a very large scale in many states because of the very positive impacts these structures have. and positive impacts of beavers. And so I just wanted to share that, like for just property, we ran through this same checklist, uh, which is just a very simple checklist on, you know, is it likely to be a good spot for these beaver dam analogs uh, and beavers? Uh, it helps kind of walk through the thought process on considerations from adjacent land use, the infrastructure, um, stream power and stream order, all that stuff. And Jeff's actually ranks out as a, kind of in the moderate, moderate region. Um, it's pretty steep, like Jeff said, fast flowing, um, but because it's, you know, not, it's got the right land use uh, and it's a small stream order that kind of helps bring it into a, a good site to try this on. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we went through this. Uh, there's also some great videos out there. I just included a link to, and you can just search cheap and cheerful stream restoration and you'll come up with all kinds of great videos on this out from out West. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first project of its kind in Iowa. Um, and again, I just really appreciate Jeff and Nancy being willing to try something very different. Um, and, and it seems to be achieving both of our goals at the current time. Uh, and then I just want to uh, make a shout out. There's a new project called the Iowa Beaver Project here in Iowa uh, that provides assistance to landowners on beavers. Uh, it's something that um, potentially would be a source of beavers. Uh, they re might relocate beavers at, at certain times. 
So Jeff and I and Nancy, you know, might talk about that as a, a potential option. Um, but for Jeff and Nancy and, and their project, the goal is to first get this habitat and some of these other things done um, before we reintroduce beavers so that there's a good chance of, of beavers actually colonizing. I am not a foot, I'm not a, a baseball player, but I, I, this is kind of my field of dreams. And I think if we build it, they will come. And build it. We have, I think, in some ways, Jeff, we've got seven of them on the landscape. Um, we could actually add probably double that, I'll say. So one point I want to make here is that you want more, not less of these in a given stream, especially if you're looking at a stream restoration, an ecosystem restoration. Um, and you don't want to over-engineer one, you want to actually have multiple because if one fails, when it fails, it's, that's a great thing. You actually end up with some of the best habitat later on as that, that ha process happens and you have subsequent ones um, that are still functioning. Uh, and so for all the same points we've already really touched on, um, you know, they, these are great features to consider in many places in Iowa, it's, that's my belief. They are not for everywhere. They can be labor intensive, um, potentially, depending on how they're built and, and how much effort you wanna put into maintaining them if you don't have beaver. Um, but beaver colonization is actually not required to achieve the habitat goals and the water quality goals, um, as in the case of, of Jeff and Nancy's property. Jeff, and anything else you wanna say in closing? The only thing I say, we're, we've got everything under control and everything's on the right program. We just need to get a better food source for the beaver there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Believe it or not, the deer eat the willows off faster than the, the willows can populate in our area. Once we yeah, get established, why we'll have the beavers. Great point, Jeff. I, that's Jeff and Nancy up in the upper right-hand side photo there, and I can't say enough about how great it is for me as a bi biologist having partners that are willing to actually get wet and dirty and, and dive in, and they've both done that. And like Jeff said, we actually tried doing some transplants on willows um, and the deer have actually proven to be the biggest challenge from that standpoint. Um, but, you know, like Jeff said, you got, it's got to be patient. You got to take our time and just, you know, not give up, try different things. And that's what we're doing on this particular project. So with that, I will say I've got questions. Jeff, is there anything else you want to add before we jump into any questions that may exist? No, no. Oh, well, the only other thing I would say is if anybody ever wants to come and look at them, and get their uh, head talked off. Come on down and, and I'll show you them. All right, well, Derek, Jeff, thanks very much. I see your cell phones there, your contact information there. Uh, I think people should feel free to reach out if there are some more questions. I We are at time, so I'm gonna uh, thank everyone for coming and, and just make one more pitch to make sure that you fill out, take a few minutes and fill out an evaluation when you exit Zoom. But I do want to stick around here for a couple minutes. There are a few questions uh, that I want to make sure we get answered. I think we've answered some of them, but uh, Margaret had a couple questions about um, kind of citing these artificial dams and then, you know, if beavers do colonize, do you think they'll um, make use of these artificial constructions or will they kind of make their own? I don't know, Derek, if you, if you can speak to that. Is there a strategy when you cite these or? There, there definitely is, and it, it is obviously system by system, um, but some general rules of thumb, like in Jeff's case where we've got these, what are called long runs uh, of the stream before they hit the sharper corners, we're trying to slow that water down under normal flow conditions um, before it's eaten at that opposite bank. And so that was one of our considerations um, in how we're citing these. Um, you do have to be careful. This is, you know, we are manipulating um, in this case, you know, we're trying to enhance that, that river hydrology, that stream hydrology, so you're, but you're manipulating it. So you do have to be careful that you don't cause additional erosion that maybe you didn't want or weren't um, anticipating. And so, you know, my, my thing is not to go willy nilly on this and go out to any stream and just start putting them in. I think if you keep it small though, and you look at the resources I've provided as well as reach out to people that are doing this, you can get some really good guidance in a short amount of time. And in all honesty, they are, if built small and not over-engineered, they actually are almost foolproof because you're dealing with all natural material. And if it washes out and breaks out, it's just, you know, down the river essentially. Um, and, you know, when you're talking really small structures, there's not going to be any, any damage to the system. Um, what was the second part of that question, Jorgen? Um, I think just about whether or not, you know, it's anticipated the beavers are going to 
build on these existing structures or maybe construct their own dams or, and I think that's kind of TBD, right? We don't really. Well, it is on this particular case uh, of just property. We know from efforts elsewhere that they absolutely will build on these structures, which is why one of the reasons we built them um, is, you know, they're attracted to that. It's already a start for them now. What is interesting is, you know, beavers know better than I think we do in most cases where they are best to be placed. It is amazing how, how if you actually see these on the landscape, an actual beaver dam, they have placed them perfectly uh, for what, you know, for holding back water, slowing it down and, and maximizing that, that pool. And so what might happen is they might maintain what we have, but they also might in most cases and most likely would build additional ones in between ours in this case, or, and that might happen on, on other people's as well, because they see the need to, you know, manipulate that further to achieve that their goals as well. Yeah. And sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna switch. I had one more really 10 second video. If you have other questions, Jorgen, maybe you can pull those up while I get this ready. Yeah. There's a question about um, if there's any concern about creating these plunge pools, you know, on the downstream sides of these dams. I don't, know if you can, uh, I don't know if you can talk about maybe the diversity. You talked about this a little bit, but how, you know, they create a diversity of aquatic habitat, not just a diversity of, of terrestrial habitat. Yeah, so that's actually why I wanted to share this video. Um, are you able to see what I've just pulled up here? Very well. Good. I will just, it's 10 seconds. I'm going to be quiet while it plays, but I want you to look in the front of the screen here, the forefront. We'll see a bunch of uh, small minnows actually utilizing this pool. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, a quick answer is no, we're not concerned with that. Uh, that is a natural thing that should exist in every, pretty much every stream system. And what happens is as you get incised, you lose that complexity, that diversity of habitat. So they are pretty much uniform level. There is no deeper pools, which then like this year, I showed that picture where they, the system dries out everything dries out if it's one level essentially. Um, this actually helps us hold water and actually gives a place for minnows and stuff to survive, frogs to survive, turtles, all that stuff. So I'll play this 10 second video and then I can wrap that into any other thoughts as well. And again, you'll see the fish on the bottom, bottom of the screen there. And I, I just share that to show that, you know, that's again a normal flow situation, but it's a very, um, from our standpoint, what we're trying to accomplish exactly what we wanted to see, which is that, that flat level coming to the beaver dam, plunge pool, and then it resumes into a, what would be a riffle habitat downstream of there with cobble and gravels, uh, which is that complexity. So we are oxidating the water too. I, believe, I don't know if that's the word for it, but we're putting oxygen in the water. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's helping cycle that water and turn it over. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's actually a spot where just downstream of there, we saw the fish. That's where some sediment is being deposited because now it's slowing down again as it hits right before it hits the, the shelf, which goes into the rest of the stream. Very good. There was a question here, too, about, you know, in some of these other examples of projects like this, how long did it take for the, for the, beavers to, you know, move in or inhabit that? Yeah, it, it varies, obviously, um, based on, you know, what the system is, if there's already beaver present in a, in a given location or not. Um, what I, I mean, it can be, it can be less than a month, uh, literally days, and they're working on these. I've seen that actually up in Minnesota uh, on my parents' property where you, you know, so anyone who's ever tried to trap beaver, you manipulate the beaver dam and they come extremely quickly. It's almost the same thing where you build it, they notice a change, and if there's already one in the area, they have to come explore it. It's almost almost a guarantee uh, within a few days, a week, that that's gonna happen. But like in Jeff and Nancy's case, if there aren't an abundance of beavers, and if there being anything they build is being destroyed, as is the case here, uh, it's gonna take a lot longer for them, one, to find it, and two, this little system, you know, doesn't have, I would say, the ideal conditions for beaver before we built these. Uh, and even now, again, it's dry right now. So it's gonna take time and the right conditions for beavers to come and utilize these structures. I mean, I think we're, having, we're having a hard time getting them out of their corn-fed environment. And there's that. They do, they do love corn and 
you know, any, like any animal, they're going to stay where, where they've got the resources they need to survive the food um, and their, their safety. Uh, and that is, uh, in a lot of cases, around crop fields and, and where they've already established a safe zone. I think you made a great point, Derek, that, you know, and Jeff, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, but your goals are, some of your goals are being met even without the beavers there, right? Like you're capturing sediment and restoring some of that natural hydrology. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna throw this question to you. You know, somebody, and somebody made a comment that uh, some of their farmers, or they know farmers who have, you know, actively uh, sought to remove some of these dams and and you know kick the beavers out basically and I don't know if you can speak to that as a landowner um, you know do you, do you get some funny looks from your neighbors when you tell them what you're doing oh absolutely and I have to explain to them that I'm trying to put beavers back into the environment and get them out of their fields uh, as a farmer last year I farmed ground in a, in a different area next to a creek and uh, when we got there all at once, it was, holy cow, stop. There's water in the field. And the beavers had flooded, I'd say, a 16th of an acre. But it was underwater. Uh, as a farmer, you, that's like taking money right out of your, your mouth. So if we can get these beavers to uh, go back to a more rural environment, why, it'll be better for them. And it's just a spot where... I think when Derek says if we can provide them safety, they'll thrive. They're, they're a necessity, and it's just one of those deals where uh, agriculture and nature are colliding. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. So we're about 10 minutes over. I want to, you know, be respectful of people's time. So I think we'll call it good for today. If we didn't get to a question, you can see Jeff and Derek's contact information there. Uh, I think you should feel free to reach out to them with any of the questions. I'm sure they'll be happy to talk, but I want to thank Jeff and Derek uh, for sharing. And then I want to thank everyone for attending and make one last pitch uh, to take a few minutes and fill out a field day evaluation when you leave. But thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you guys.